than 100 years, Australia and the United States have fought side by side as allies, building a relationship we've come to know as the Alliance. In this series, we'll bring you the complete story of our Pacific partnership. We'll explore the cultural, economic and military ties that bring Canberra closer to Washington and the historic links at the heart of our two democracies. This year marks the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty. And for many in the Pacific region, it's never been more important. This isn't just a, a dusty piece of paper that we get out and we celebrate whenever the number is round enough for us. This is an active and alive relationship that every day in Canberra and every day in Washington, D.C., our senior leaders wake up and they, they continue to walk forward and develop this alliance. In episode four, we look at how the official anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty was marked on both sides of the Pacific. That partnership is as essential today as it ever has been in securing the safety and prosperity of both our countries. Plus triumph and disaster, how our alliance grew closer in the war on terror and how there is still work to be done. That's all to come on The Alliance. The star-spangled banner yet waves. <laughs> 20 years on from 9-11 and presidents past and present gathered in New York to honour those who died on America's darkest day. For the families of those lost on September 11, 2001, the feelings of anguish and heartbreak do not get any easier, even after two decades. Their lives were changed forever. Memorials were also held at the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania, where President George W. Bush paid tribute to the passengers and crew of Flight 93 the men and women who bravely fought back against the terrorists. For those too young to recall that clear September day, it is hard to describe the mix of feelings we experienced. There was horror at the scale of destruction and awe at the bravery and kindness that rose to meet it. There was shock at the audacity of evil in gratitude for the heroism and decency that opposed it. In the sacrifice of the first responders, in the mutual aid of strangers, in the solidarity of grief and grace, the actions of an enemy revealed the spirit of a people. And we were proud of our wounded nation. 10 Australians were killed in the attacks and in New York, our ambassador, Arthur Sinodinus, represented the nation in paying his respects to our 9-11 victims, as well as the first responders who tried to save them. For Australians, our first priority was standing by our American friends. As we honour those lives lost 20 years ago today, I am inspired by the resilience of this great nation that will forever hold them in its heart. We stand by you today and always. God bless the United States of America. In 2001, Arthur Sinodinus was Chief of Staff to John Howard, then our Prime Minister. Mr Howard was in Washington when the attacks began. Well, like everybody else, I felt complete shock. It was totally unexpected. There'd been no warning. When I heard about the first one, we all thought it was an accident. Then I turned on the television and I saw the horror unfolding and... Uh, it's just impossible to say other than that I was utterly shocked and dumbfounded. And over the minutes and hours that passed, I um, tried to assimilate it after the news conference. I pulled back the blinds and you could see the smoke rising from the Pentagon area. So uh, we all suddenly realised that uh, what was to be an epoch changing event had occurred. As time went by that day, most people to whom I spoke, and I felt the same way myself, 
thought this could be the first of a series of attacks around the world. Uh, now, that didn't materialise, but a lot of us thought it might. This had been unexpected. Why wouldn't you have an attack on London or Tokyo or Paris or Sydney? Why not? Uh, everything was there as a possibility. Prime Minister Howard was visiting the United States to mark the 50th anniversary of the ANZUS Treaty and met President Bush for the first time only the day before. I had been invited and was scheduled to address a joint sitting in Congress on the 12th of September. Uh, and I did keep that engagement, but I didn't deliver an address because the Congress assembled in joint session to pass a resolution authorising the administration to take retaliatory action against those responsible for the horror of the day before. But I was glad I went because I was the only person in the gallery and I was given a standing ovation by the joint sitting of Congress. And it was, as it turned out, a fortuitous demonstration of uh, Australian support, Australian empathy, and Australian solidarity with the United States at such a difficult time. Standing side by side with the United States, a decision was taken to invoke the treaty for the first time. Neither of us have been directly attacked since the treaty has been written until 9-11. And Prime Minister Howard recognized the criticality of that importance and that we were in great need at the moment. What was done was an act of war against the United States. You can be assured of Australia's resolute solidarity with the American people that those responsible for this will be hunted down and meted out the justice that they so much deserve. The fact that Prime Minister Howard was here and reacted almost immediately to stand up on behalf of the United States, and we delivered, being amongst the very first boots on the ground in Afghanistan, it hasn't been lost on the American people, and certainly it's seared into the memory of the leaders here in Washington. America will never forget the first and only time the Collective Defense Articles of Anzus Treaty were formally invoked 20 years ago. It was September the 11th. Our Australian friends stood with us in that darkest hour. John Howard gives credit to his foreign minister, Alexander Downer, for inspiring the move to invoke Anzus. What happened was that when um, I got on board the plane, it was Air Force Two, which the Americans uh, made available to fly me and my party from Andrews Air Force Base in Washington to Hawaii. Uh, I, I rang Alexander Downer uh, to talk about what had happened. And during the course of that conversation, it was Alexander who said to me, I think we should invoke the ANZUS Treaty. And I immediately agreed with him. And we were having a discussion about the reactions to the 9-11 attacks. And I said to him, you know, one of the things we could do is invoke the ANZUS Alliance for the first time in, in those days, 50 years. Um, and he, he was um, excited about the idea and he spoke to the Americans about it. And so we had a cabinet meeting the following, uh, the following week where we formally agreed to invoke the ANZUS Alliance. So, um, uh, you know, it, of course, in, in practice was more of a symbolic gesture than anything, but um, it was quite rightly at a, at a time when w the whole world and particularly America's allies were rallying to support the United States, which we duly did. Uh, it was um, adding symbolism to the substance of the offer to stand beside the Americans. The Americans could, of course, have carried out the whole operation without help from anybody. But I knew that for a number of reasons they would want some partners, and I also knew. It was made very clear to me by President Bush when we met in Shanghai only a few weeks later at an APEC meeting. It was made very clear by him that, uh, that uh, the Americans wanted us beside them. After 9-11, our government committed Australian troops to the war on terror. The initial fight in Afghanistan to put an end to terrorist training camps 
would lead to a broader regime change, a course of action that would consume a generation of leaders. Federal MP Philip Thompson was only at school on 9-11. He would later join up and serve with our forces in Afghanistan. I joined in 2006, um, so there was people uh, from regular units, the Special Forces world, uh, fighting uh, in Afghanistan. And when I joined, it's, it's what I looked at, what I wanted to do. I wanted to go contribute to my bit and, and fight in the war on terror. I've fought alongside Americans uh, and people that have been affected through September 11. So it's a, it's a time where, where I reflect, it's a time where I uh, reach out to my mates both here and over uh, in the States and you know, wrap around them and come together because that's what kicked off the war on terror. Following 9-11, heightened concerns that rogue states would distribute weapons of mass destruction to terrorist cells moved the Americans' focus from the defeated Taliban to Iraq under Saddam Hussein. Determined to avoid another catastrophe on America's homeland, President Bush lent on intelligence to quickly build a coalition to invade Iraq. Australia was among the willing. The fundamental reason why the United States uh, decided to go to war in Iraq was it, it did believe that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction and that wasn't invented or lied about. It was based on solid intelligence. In fact, I've reread some of those intelligence reports quite recently because, and um, there, was, there was little doubt that the intelligence, which is largely American, but some of it was, was from the British as well, indicated that those weapons of mass destruction did exist. Now, in the end, stockpiles weren't found. Programs, the capacity to make them, uh, the maps, the design papers, if you like, they were all there. And you never get absolute proof with intelligence. One of the interesting things to me was that when President Obama was about to give the order to take out bin Laden in Pakistan, one of his senior intelligence people said to him, Mr. President, you should understand that the evidence that bin Laden is in that house in Abbottabad in Pakistan is less convincing than the evidence that was presented that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. That gives you an idea of how uh, intelligence is, is never perfect. Now, to his great credit, President Obama gave the order nonetheless and it proved to be absolutely right. The shock and awe tactics used to invade Iraq were a success. The aim soon changed to winning hearts and minds on the ground. Accomplishing this mission would prove much more challenging. Uh, I think the administration made a big mistake disbanding the Iraqi army and the, the process of debarthification. That's rooting out people who'd supported Saddam from the, the civil service in Iraq. I think that was a mistake. You've always got to leave behind when there's a regime change of that kind. You've got to leave behind an administrative infrastructure. And, of course, by disbanding the Iraqi army, you put on the streets of Iraq some heavily armed people who had no reason to be other than hostile to the Americans. A major criticism of the war in Iraq is that it would distract the Allies from their objectives in Afghanistan. Well, the, uh, the distraction argument hinges on whether the Americans should have poured still more resources into Afghanistan um, at that time. The problem isn't anything to do with, um, with Iraq. Um, the problem is that when the Americans and the, their allies, when we were all very strong in Afghanistan, we had the, pr the place pretty much under control. Um, I think I'd say this in hindsight. I don't think I thought this through at the time. Um, but, I, uh, but we needed to be looking at how to create an inclusive government there which would have had to have included some elements of the Taliban um, and working with the Pakistanis too on that inclusive government. In the end, when we were weak, the Americans weren't able to persuade the Taliban to make a sensible agreement with the Afghan government and with the Americans. Enemies in both Iraq and Afghanistan would emerge and grow in confidence in the years that followed. Bloodshed was inevitable. The carnage that I saw there, whether it was through IEDs, um, you know, there was 
pretty pretty intense gunfights that happened all around the regions. Uh, our A and A, uh, we, we lost a fair few of them um, from uh, an IED strike uh, when they were driving. Uh, I lost uh, a really close friend of mine, Ben Renato. Uh, in my time in Afghanistan, friends of mine missing limbs from there, and uh, I was also wounded there. So. Uh, my time on the ground really kind of shaped the, my, my, my picture of how I view the world now. And uh, Afghanistan was a, a lovely place, lovely people, but geez, uh, the, the Taliban were ruthless. And uh, now to see what they're doing uh, back, back in Afghanistan is, is pretty gut wrenching. It, it is tough to see uh, the Taliban retake areas where we've fought in been injured in or wounded in and have our um, soldiers killed in. To see the Taliban not just take that ground, but then take the capital, be sitting in the, the presidential palace, it's tough to see. Uh, we don't want to see these people there. They are terrorists. We, we fought the Taliban and we kept them on the run. We kept them in the hills and we stopped large-scale terrorism attacks happening from uh, around the world, including in Australia. For those that fought bravely in Afghanistan, the scenes over recent weeks have stirred anger and alarm. A plan had to be developed to leave Afghanistan over time, but the circumstances and the conditions had to be created as well. And um, the Biden administration, following the lead of the... You know, people always want to make the political points, but following the lead of the Trump administration, no doubt about that. But the Biden administration just decided to cut and run. Um, no proper preparation, um, absolutely chaotic, chaotic uh, logistical planning, um, used the wrong airport, didn't uh, pre-arrange and pre-position people, um, just suddenly decided to go and the timetable became the master of the chaos. Um, whereas what um, they should have done is make it perfectly clear over a long period of time that there are conditions for their withdrawal and the conditions would be tied up with um, ongoing logistical and perhaps some air support for the Afghan Defence Force um, and an inclusive government. I'm sure it might include some elements of the Taliban, um, but they didn't, they just walked out. Um, and to be fair to countries like the UK and Australia and other American allies, well, we just don't have the capacity to stay there on our own without the Amer huge American logistical and air support which made um, the presence there possible. But, um, I, I mean, I think it's been very damaging to America's standing in the world. Speaking exclusively to the Alliance, Prime Minister Morrison revealed that he joined Britain and France in urging the Biden administration to extend the deadline for withdrawal. Of course, and communicated that um, in support of their position at the time. Uh, but ultimately, that was always going to be a function of the security situation on the ground. I, I have no doubt that if the United States were able to extend that and to, to provide more time to get people out, then they would have done so. Uh, but the security on the situation on the ground did not lend itself to that, and, and we know that quite, quite tragically. Um, the suicide bomber at the Abbey Gate that took 13 American lives. Um, I mean, that is just such, such a tragedy that at those very last hours, while American soldiers were trying to provide a path to freedom for people, they were met with that terror. Our diggers were with their allies just before the attack. We are very close uh, to, to our American allies. My mates that are um, who've just come back from Afghanistan were with the 13 um, US Marines that were killed uh, in Kabul. Uh, and uh, they were with them just hours uh, previous before the, the, the coward terrorist detonated um, a bomb there. And so, the, you know, and, and they feel like they're friends, the people that we call brothers and sisters. Uh, were, were taken and they feel uh, all the emotions that they would have felt if it was one of their own. Has the mission in Afghanistan been a failure? Has it reduced the American prestige internationally? No, I don't believe so, ultimately. I understand that view in, in the moment. Of course I do. I mean, it has been a, a, a terrible, a terrible episode um, in, in that 
uh, engagement coming to an end. Um, it's not clear to me how it was ever going to come to an end in any markedly different way, if we're really honest about it. We were there for 20 years. Uh, we were there for the right reasons. We were there to deny Osama bin Laden a, a base from which to operate. The Americans had been very clear all those years ago, hand him over. The Taliban said no. So we turned up with our American friends and many others and, and, and got that job done. After that occurred though, um, the, the situation changed. A great vacuum had been created in Afghanistan and we were all there and sought over many, many years to make a failed state a successful one. Now, many have tried that in the past in that part of the world and they've also not seen a great deal of success. But I do know this, for 20 years, that threat of global terror that was able to base itself out of Afghanistan was denied. And, you know, the countries that really enabled um, the Taliban and others uh, were not any actions of the United States, quite the contrary, but those who gave safe harbour and comfort to the Taliban. And uh, that is, that is, you know, a, a great tragedy. Coming up, free trade and how our economic relationship has prospered. Whilst the Howard era is best remembered for invoking the ANZUS Treaty for the first time, and of course the subsequent war on terror, one of the most important and lasting changes to the Pacific Partnership was economic rather than military. The free trade agreement that came into effect in 2005 would come to have a huge impact on Australians. It was significant for a number of reasons, and not least because it happened at all. America doesn't make free trade agreements with developed countries, apart from the North American Free Trade Agreement. Uh, that's generally the rule. Now, I'm speaking of, of, of the time period when we began to negotiate it now. Uh, it, it was obviously of particular relevance to the relationship. It was obviously part inspired by the close relationship we had. I don't think in any way it was a the payback for our involvement in Iraq or Afghanistan. I'm not suggesting that for a moment, uh, because we'd been talking about it before uh, September 11. Alexander Downer remembers how the seeds to the FTA were sown many years before. Yeah, it has a little bit of history. It goes back to, um, to when I first met George W. Bush. He was the governor of Texas, and I was the foreign minister. I was passing through passing through uh, Austin um, and, and went and saw him on the advice of our then Ambassador Andrew Peacock, who told me that this governor of Texas would be the next president of the United States. And um, we talked a lot about trade and um, George W. Bush said to me that, you know, we really want to build a, a network of free trade agreements if I um, become the president. And um, so when he did become the president, we went back to the administration and said, uh, um, how about um, negotiating a free trade agreement? And, and look, you know, it was more of a John Howard, George W. Bush moment. Um, the president said, um, yeah, I think that's really a great idea. Um, we'll go ahead and do it. I mean, I don't doubt that um, the ANZUS Alliance, the personal relationships we'd built with the Bush administration, um, the um, broad liberal economic philosophy of George W. Bush and the, and the Howard government, um, and the fact that we had demonstrated our commitment to the alliance and the relationship through both Afghanistan and Iraq, all of those factors played into um, the decision to go ahead with the, with the negotiations for a free trade agreement. And my recollection is they only took about sort of 15 to 18 months and, they, and, and we sealed the deal. Not a perfect deal, by the way, but it was quite a good deal. The deal meant that more than 97% of Australia's non-agricultural exports became duty-free. Importantly, it also meant that Australian companies had access to government procurement markets at both federal and state level. We have access to 
government procurement opportunities with so many of the American states, which of course are large economies in themselves. You think of a state like California, a massive economy, the fifth largest economy in the world, if you look at it separately. Um, the state of Texas, which I know well, has a population 25 million, the same as Australia. So there are all sorts of procurement opportunities. They get to be of, of, of great assistance. Uh, but of course, the greatest link between Australia and the United States is foreign investment. The United States is by far the biggest foreign investor in Australia. And uh, uh, that's been the case for decades. And, and one of the principal reasons for that is that investors know that um, there are, there's a proper environment. If you invest in Australia, um, your money won't disappear other than through bad <laughs> business behaviour. Since the FTA was agreed, trade in goods and services between Australia and the US has almost doubled. And to make it easier for Australians to live and work in America, a new visa scheme was announced at the same time. America has a very interesting visa system for Australians. There's something called the E3 visa, whereby 10,500 visas are reserved for Australians with special skills to come to the United States. And those are renewable indefinitely. They're, they're processed very quickly. They're not expensive. And it allows your spouse and your children to work as well. So it's a very special visa. Other countries don't have that. Whilst invoking the ANZUS Treaty wasn't the reason for the FTA and generous visa allowance, it certainly didn't hurt negotiations. And certainly, I think there was a lot of recognition and appreciation for the support that Australia provided not only in Afghanistan after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, but in every major conflict since 1918. There is no other country in the world that has stood with America and fought with America for freedom and liberty and justice. Australia is our only mate. Freshly appointed ambassador Dennis Richardson arrived in Washington just after the deal was locked in. And I think Enormous credit must go to my predecessor, Michael Thorley, and to Prime Minister Howard, uh, and to Mark Vale, who was the Trade Minister at the time, um, and also Alexander Downer. I think uh, those, those people led the way on that. I think, uh, quite frankly, I think Michael Thorley saw the opportunity, was able to sell that to Prime Minister Howard, and it, uh, and it went from there. The deal would make a big difference to lives of Australians already living in America. Coffee shop owner Alexander Hall remembers how hard it was to get a visa to stay in the US. Yeah, it's a tricky one, you know. Um, there, where there's a will, there's a way. You basically have to get yourself in with a very good immigration lawyer. Um, I ebbed and throwed th through visas. Um, you know, when I first moved here, E3 visas hadn't, didn't exist. Um, they've subsequently exist now and it makes it a lot easier. There's B1 visas, B12 visas, there's O visas. I was very lucky. I was in a, in a happy relationship with my wife when we decided to get married. Um, so I've now got a green card through marriage, but that was a very tough process. Um, a lot of interviews, um, a lot of reliance on her. Like she had had to file taxes for many years in a row and basically she was had to sponsor me. The E3 visa system works now. Originally, Alexander started out in New York. Yeah, the idea originally was to come to America, get an idea from America and take it back to Australia. But after coming to America, and this is, you know, like I said, 15 years ago, there wasn't any good cafes. You know, there was order and pay at the counter coffee shops and bagel stores, but there was none of that extra hospitality service that I've been used to in Melbourne, uh, full table service, well-designed spaces. So uh, we found a space, a 600 square foot location in Brooklyn. Um, we opened it and kind of gangbusters took off. We called it a milk bar, you know, like a traditional kind of Melbourne name for a corner store. And uh, we did full table service and, uh, and it really worked. Um, but I think that this cafe, Australian cafe style of elevating casual food um, is a market that's still kind of really untapped here. Ironically, rather than bringing an idea back to Australia, the cafe owner stayed in the US and is now building a successful chain in Des Moines, Iowa. For Hall, the Midwest is a land of opportunity. 
I think they're more profitable in the Midwest. Um, I think that the labour... Uh, people I found in New York, the kids that go there are to, there to do anything other than work in a restaurant. They move to New York to be a mime or a playwright or anything other than work in a restaurant. They end up having to work in a restaurant. So labour's tricky there. Um, New York is very tough for getting a plumber, getting an electrician. Landlords are, are, are a lot more tough to deal with. The deals are nowhere near as good. A place in, you know, like the Midwest, where the landlord wants you just to have a successful business and pay rent for 10 years. Whereas in New York, they really don't care if they burn you and you turn over and you spend all the money on the fit out of their, their restaurant and, and then they'll find someone else to bump the rent up. So it, it's, a, it's a different mindset and it's much more in the favour of the tenant in Des Moines as opposed to New York. Big differences in America's employment laws make a big difference to his bottom line. The system is way better. For, from the employer's perspective, and I'm talking specifically from the employer's perspective, you know, we, we have a base minimum wage in this country. Um, in Des Moines, believe it or not, it's 4 35 an hour for a tipped employee, which is pretty low. We obviously don't pay that. We pay a little more than that. Um, but it's a system where the consumer pays the wage. You know, it, it's a tip, to, tip society. And what it does, it puts the burden of the performance onto the employee. Um, it makes the employees way more active in trying to sell uh, and ultimately making the, the business more money, but them making more money. And, and they take somewhat of an ownership. And I always remember, like in, in Australia, my staff would come to work and they would say, I hope it's quiet today. Because they're going to get the same money whether it's busy or not. Whereas in America, the first thing they would say is, like, I hope it's busy today. Uh, because they know that their income is reliant on how busy the store is. But you could run a cafe here and have pay someone four thirty-five an hour and have no on cost, which I know is crippling in Australia. You know, I, I watch the market there and I see that cafes don't open on weekends, they don't open on public holidays, which to me is like mind-blowing because they're the days where people are off and you should be making money. But it's, it's at such a disadvantage to be able to, to pay those employees so much higher rate that you, it's not even worth opening, which, which is not good for society. People want to be able to go to a cafe on Melbourne Cup Day. They want to be able to go to a cafe on the Queen's Birthday weekend, whatever it is. And with those laws being so egregiously in the favour of the employee, it, it makes it tough to run a business. Understanding the differences in how Americans and Australians do business is at the heart of FD Global. Founder and CEO Trina Blair helps Australian and American enterprises who are looking to scale up. FD Global Connections are established in 2014 with the purpose of supporting Australian businesses to launch into the US. It was off the back of research that I did at that time, which indicated that 70% of Australian companies that launch into the US actually fail. And as I was researching that, I was wondering why that was. Now, having lived and worked in the US myself, I, I could appreciate the challenges that businesses were having. And then I worked out how perhaps I could help them be successful in the market. Petrina, there are three areas most businesses need to focus on to be scalable, particularly in the US. One is around your sales process. The other is around your customer service and support. And the other is around your marketing activities. You've got to ensure that they are scalable, repeatable and predictable. Now, of course, if you're in manufacturing, you also need to ensure that you can deliver against those metrics as well. But doing that audit on your business to ensure that it is scalable is vitally important before you launch into the market. So that's all part of the preparation uh, that businesses need to do along with that market research. FD Global has worked with a diverse range of Australian businesses. Another organisation that we worked with, which I'm very proud of, is AGB Events. Now, people may be familiar with AGB Events because they were the originators and creators of Sydney Vivid Lights. Now, they're not involved in that anymore, but they do amazing digital exhibitions. And one of those was called Beauty Rich and Rare, which was the story of Sir Joseph Banks and his trip to Australia as a botanist, as a scientist, as an artist. I was engaged by AGB Events to secure the exhibition at a major museum in the United States. The short story is that we were successful in securing the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C., and that was launched in January 2019. It was a really joy to be working on that. And then we were working with uh, Trina, Trina Blair, and, and also the consulate and the embassy in 
Washington, the Australian Embassy, and the consulate in New York. And so they introduced us to the Smithsonian. And the Smithsonian were keen to have this story presented, so it's a digital exhibition. And so we were chosen, and it was the first Australian exhibition to be shown at the Smithsonian in Washington, which was terrific. We were really thrilled about that and, and honoured to be the first exhibition there from Australia. FD Global were really terrific because um, they opened a lot of doors for us, so, which, which we would never get to in the, you know, to be able to have a seat at that table and meet the heads of different corporate companies. I mean, I remember um, sort of pinching myself. For FD Global, it's essential to understand that the US is more than just one market. It is 50 markets. Every state is different. And it's different both from a, a tax, a regulatory a compliance perspective. It's different from a business protocol perspective. It's different from a cultural language, um, all sorts of different nuances. And it's even different from a dress code perspective. So think about California and what you wear in business meetings there versus New York. Um, so understanding those differences is vitally important. Again, that comes back to your market research. Another aspect to consider is how the free trade agreement is constantly evolving to incorporate new industries and strategic priorities for the Alliance partners. Every year the FTA is reviewed and so recent industries like the space industry for example has been considered as part of the FTA. So the government is right on top of the FTA agreement um, and what the needs are of both countries one other thing I would say about the FTA agreement is that it's not a transactional agreement. It's a relationship agreement. And I think that goes to the heart of the closeness between Australia and the United States, that it's based on trust, it's based on relationship. And for business leaders, I think that's a really important message as well. When you're looking to launch into the US, you've got to treat it like a relationship, not a transaction. So even if you lose a deal, you have lost the transaction, but don't lose the relationship and the contact with that individual. Coming up, the Alliance at 70. How our nation celebrated the ANZUS milestone. September 21 was a big month for the Alliance. Not only did Australia and the United States celebrate 70 years of ANZUS and mark the only time the treaty was invoked, old allies forged a new defence pact for the 21st century. And so Friends AUKUS is born, a new enhanced trilateral security partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States. AUKUS, a partnership where our technology, our scientists, our industry our defence forces are all working together to deliver a safer and more secure region that ultimately benefits all. An obvious move to counter the growing strategic threat posed by China, AUKUS will encompass diplomatic and technological collaboration. To begin with, Australia will be trusted with a major deterrent designed to keep the Indo-Pacific safe. The first major initiative of AUKUS will be to deliver a nuclear-powered submarine fleet for Australia. Over the next 18 months, we will work together to seek to determine the best way forward to achieve this. Only a handful of countries possess nuclear-powered submarines. And it is a momentous decision for any nation to acquire this formidable capability, and perhaps equally momentous for any other state to come to its aid. But Australia, is one of our oldest friends, a kindred nation, and a fellow democracy and a natural partner in this enterprise. Because we all recognize the imperative of ensuring peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific over the long term. We need to be able to address both the current strategic environment in the region and how it may evolve. In some ways, the new trilateral partnership is an evolution of the ANZUS Treaty. Although it's important to note that AUKUS, like many other agreements put in place over the last 70 years, is here to build upon ANZUS, not to replace it. ANZUS remains the foundation. 
To celebrate 70 years of the Alliance, the sails on the Sydney Opera House were lit up. In Washington, a message from the President. Today we mark a significant milestone in an alliance between the United States and Australia. 70 years ago, our countries came together to sign the ANSYS Treaty, creating an enduring partnership, quote, to strengthen the fabric of peace, end of quote, in the Indo-Pacific region. That partnership is as essential today as it ever has been in securing the safety and prosperity of both our countries. And on this anniversary, we reaffirm our commitment to advancing our shared values, democratic norms, global security, and the prosperity for the next 70 years and beyond. The message from the White House was followed up by a direct call between President Biden and our Prime Minister. How important is it for leaders to build a rapport in this alliance framework? Oh, look, it's very important. It, it, it brings together all the things that happen um, behind the scenes at, at various levels of the relationship. Um, and we've seen it most recently um, in relationship with the United Kingdom, for example, and the securing of the free trade agreement there. At the end of the day, Boris and I had to sit in a room over some lamb and crunch the deal. Um, and we've had a very positive relationship and that continues over many issues. Um, you know, I've, I've worked with two administrations and, uh, and, and in both of those administrations, I've so sought to establish that rapport and I, I very much appreciate the rapport which has been established already with President Biden. Why is the 70th anniversary of the ANZUS Alliance, why is that important for us to be celebrating and to mark that anniversary? Because it is the bedrock of our safety and security in this part of the world. It has guaranteed our safety for 70 years. It is the foundational principle, the founding, foundation platform that the US has acknowledged in my discussion with President Biden the other day. He also referred to it as the bedrock of stability here in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and, uh, and for Australia, importantly, it enables us to to, to move forward with confidence, to be able to plan for our future, knowing that partnering with the United States in a positive way within our region creates a more stable, a safer and more secure region where we can engage with countries in our region, we can trade, we can do all of these things. It, it provides that balance, it provides that stability, it provides that shelter under which all of us in Australia live. Can we rely on the United States, particularly in the current climate of a more inward-looking Oh, absolutely. Approach. See, I've, I've never doubted the alliance. And, you know, a, a lot is said. A lot of criticisms are made of the United States. Over the, I've heard them all. Oh, this is, this is them gone this time, this is them gone. And you know what? Look, they're an amazing nation. And they're a resilient nation. And they're a nation that is innovative, that believes it passionately in freedom. I mean, the very peace that we've had since the Second World War, all of the institutions that maintain that were actually established by the visionaries in the United States after the Second World War. And that architecture, the rule of law, all of these things that is applied through all of the institutions provides the certainty in which we live right now. The United States is a, is a, a determined nation, a great friend of Australia. And uh, I don't think that it's certainly in my mind is, is ever in question. Seventy years is a long time, and for an alliance to endure through all sorts of changing circumstances over seven decades really is hugely significant. I've heard it said here several times that Australia has many friends, but it has just one ally, the United States, and that feeling is reciprocated. And so I think as we celebrate the 70th anniversary of ANZUS, I think we can look with confidence to the next 70 years as well. I think it's absolutely something we're celebrating, and, and I think we're going to celebrate not just in Australia, but in the United States uh, this year, because it is. It's, it's a tree that underpins really the economic uh, success that we've seen uh, in our two countries since the post-World War II uh, period. And what's important to note is this isn't just uh, a dusty piece of paper that we get out and we celebrate whenever the number is round enough for us. This is an active and alive relationship that every day in Canberra and every day in Washington, D.C., our senior leaders wake up and they, they continue to walk forward and develop this alliance. So it's an active living uh, thing.
Military personnel working in the Pentagon walk this corridor every day, a corridor dedicated to the ANZUS Treaty. It serves as a constant reminder of just how important our ANZUS alliance really is. Very few Australians would know that there are effectively five large corridors in the Pentagon, four of which are turned over to the Marines, the Air Force, the Army and the Navy. And the fifth one is turned over to the Australia, New Zealand and US alliance. And the largest part of that is the Australian and US part of that alliance because it's been the most consistent. And they're very proud of that in the Pentagon. And every Australian should be proud of that. I think most Australians think that the United States hardly knows that we exist. Uh, and they get told that a lot by commentators. But when you go to the Pentagon and you go to Washington, you realise that the policy makers in defence and foreign affairs really elevate the Australian relationship. I mean, they, they feel it very much in their hearts that we're always the first in and the last out with the Americans. I was privileged to have a secondment in the Pentagon, so I used to take great pride in walking along the Australian Alliance hallway and my British colleagues didn't have a hallway, they were part of NATO. So it's a really significant um, you know, relationship, strategic partnership, and yes, I think it's worth, worth celebrating. Our Defence Minister, Peter Dutton, came here to the Pentagon as part of the Osmin meetings. AUKUS and the new submarine capability very much on the table. Uh, there are many layers of uh, our defence mechanism and the relationships that, uh, that we need to keep uh, in a very healthy position and th that's really been the objective. So if there is a war with China that looks like that's something that the intelligence you're saying is quite something of a possibility, these nuclear subs will put Australians right on the front line. I, I think what the, uh, the nuclear subs do and, and, and beyond that, I mean, what we're achieving uh, out of the discussions with uh, the secretary or both secretaries, so uh, Blinken and Austin, is... Uh, the ability to, to have an interoperability, so a seamless uh, moving of our forces uh, in and out of theirs, uh, the ability to base uh, assets, including air and maritime assets, uh, force posture, uh, all of that is, is an important element to the domestic picture over the course of the next couple of decades, and that's what we now set ourselves up for. And I think that provides a deterrence effect to China and anyone else uh, who would seek to, to do harm to... Australia. But, but, but let me be very clear, our, our desire is to maintain peace, um, but you don't maintain peace from a position of weakness. And we have made historic decisions here. We've come to agreements uh, that have never been able to, to land before. And that reflects the period in which we're living and what we think potentially lies ahead. Uh, but importantly, it provides stability in our region. And it also says to our neighbours that Australia is increasing its capability, its capacity through our relationship with the United States and the United Kingdom and other partners. Uh, and we hope that that's a force of, for good in, in our region. Not everyone is happy about the direction that the alliance is headed. France might be disappointed and China alarmed about AUKUS. But here in Canberra, both sides of politics agree that the new security partnership is going to strengthen peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific rather than undermine it. Next time on The Alliance. From trade to technology, how today's partnership is building for a stronger future. That's all to come on The Alliance.